I think we're looking for Gerhard is my understanding. We're looking for Gerhard is my understanding. We seem to have lost him, yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, Okay, so we'll start the second tutorial of this morning. So we are pleased to have uh, Laura Fillon, who is going to teach us everything we need to know about machine learning in order to start talking about uh, machine learning and classes uh, later this week. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm very happy to have been invited to participate in what looks like a very wonderful conference. So far, it's gotten off to a great start with the talk by Olivier. Um, and so yeah, I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about supercool liquids and a lot about machine learning. And so I was asked to kind of give a little bit of a tutorial and in particular try to talk to the people in the room who are not machine learning experts. So I'm assuming there's lots of glassy experts in the room, but we're not all we're not all machine learning experts. And I'm going to do that with examples from machine learning. I'm going to uh, sorry with examples from glassy systems and some other similar systems. Um, I'm not going to make any efforts at all to cover the, the literature on any of these topics completely. We've got a tremendous number of experts and a tremendous number of talks that are coming up in the next two days, which are going to address many questions. So we're going to just hopefully get through some of the th some things that I find at least very interesting. And I hope that you guys at the end of this understand a little bit more, at least those who are new to machine learning, understand a little bit more about what's under the hood whenever we say short acronyms that people don't really necessarily understand. Um, so just in case you don't know who I am, um, my name is Laura Fillion and I do research on a wide variety of systems. One of the underlying themes is that it's usually colloidal systems. My research has looked at machine learning, and structure, uh, machine learning structure and dynamics in a variety of systems. I'm rather fascinated by defects and so I've spent a fair bit of my career unearthing strange defects in colloidal systems. I've looked at crystal nucleation and some of the pictures I will show at some point in time today go into that direction. And then recently I've done some work on coarse graining soft matter interactions using machine learning techniques or linear regression and reverse engineering, or reverse engineering interactions between colloidal systems. But of course today I'm focusing only on one of these aspects and actually I'm hopefully telling you guys lots of new stuff about machine learning, at least for the newbies in the room. And so one might ask the question, why, and wh why do we actually even want to talk about machine learning whenever it comes to glassy systems? And I hope that some of the questions that were addressed or at least pointed out at the end of Olivier's talk actually start to ask that question or start to push you towards the question that maybe there's interesting data techniques that we could use for understanding glassy materials or supercooled liquids better. I think one of the most intriguing places where we might ask, okay, what can we learn from machine learning aspects or what can we learn from data is the correlation between structure and dynamics in these systems. Can we develop algorithms that are able to identify different structural regions, finding different, probing different structures? Are we able to correlate structures with dynamics? Are we able to learn the relationship between structure and dynamics? And so those are things I want to talk about today. But I think also just as a, as a side point, I think that the possibilities of machine learning and machine learning and glassy systems is much, much broader. And I'm not going to go into all of these aspects today by any stretch, but it will also include, I think in the future, learning to speed up simulation methods, which was apparently a topic from two weeks ago of the, or a couple of weeks ago of a different workshop in the same place. But I think that, that there's a number of directions where machine learning is going to make a big avenue in the future. Today I'm going to really focus on one that I think is really close to many of our hearts if we're talking about glassy systems, which is really focusing on structure and dynamics, their correlations and understanding how we might try to harness this tool for understanding this. And so if I, at least in my very uh, maybe biased view, I think that there's been a lot of work over the last number of years, but to me it really, the, the work that really opened my eyes to what we could do with machine learning and dynamics or machine learning and glassy systems were these two papers from the group of Andrea Liu, she's in the audience today, on identifying structural flow defects and disordered systems using machine learning methods and a structural pro approach to relaxation in glassy liquids. And this at least was to me a big eye opener in hey, what can we possibly gather from these methods? And I'm not going to go into everyone's work today by a long shot because I think there's many people who can do a much better job of that themselves. But this to me at least was kind of really where my, my thinking started 
on this topic. And so, again, going to the, the non-experts in the, in, the, in the room, if I look at machine learning in kind of a general aspect and ask, okay, what are, what are the kinds of things we might want to do with it? Most of machine learning, and not all of it, but most of machine learning can be broadly broken up into two different kinds of directions. We talk about unsupervised machine learning, which is machine learning which is designed to try to figure something out for you in your system. If you picture we have a, a system and we would like to learn an order parameter for that system. We want the algorithm to do something for us. It should somehow pick out the most important features, find the variations in our system, develop an order parameter for us. That's, that's the kind of things we might do with unsupervised machine learning. Feature extraction, the and, and if you think about what might end up in here, and we'll talk about these aspects later, we get feature extraction, we get character, we get dimensionality reduction. There's, I think, going to be a lot of discussion by Daniele later on about that as well, and clustering. But then there's another direction or type of machine learning, which is really just a fancy word for fitting. We have f various kinds of fitting functions, and to me, supervised machine learning is really all about using modern analysis to find complex ways, or even hopefully simple ways sometimes, of fitting complex data. And so these algorithms are really trained with a data set where we know what the desired outcome is, and we're trying to learn that, that interaction somehow. And these are things that, for all intents and purposes, fit are kind of now encoded in what we would call machine learning. And so my talk is going to go through, first of all, a couple of examples, at least what I think of as the main, most important aspects of unsupervised learning and then supervised learning, and then with applications that I hope give you guys a little bit of an idea of why these things might be very powerful. So we're going to start with the top one, which is unsupervised. So the questions we might want to address, uh, and these are not a complete picture by any stretch of the imagination, but if we're looking at super cool glasses, and we ask, okay, what could we possibly address with it with an unsupervised algorithm? One of the things we could do is look at a structure. Here we have a mixture, a poly, sorry, a binary mixture of hard spheres, which is in a supercooled state. And we could ask, are there structural heterogeneities? And can we develop an algorithm which is able to identify structural he heterogeneities in this system? And this is actually, that, that question has nothing to do with the dynamics as a starting point. We're going to ask the supervised algorithm in a little while can you find the largest structural variations in the system? And I'm going to pretend for a minute I know nothing about the dynamics. And then I can use that, or we could use that to say, are these structural variations somehow correlated to the dynamical variations in the system? So it's a bit of a two-part question. First, what are the largest structural variations? And then secondarily, are these structural variations that a machine learning algorithm or that an unsupervised machine learning algorithm determines, are they somehow connected to the dynamics? And we're, of course, hoping they are. But, we're not, but this question doesn't actually put in any of the dynamics as a starting point. Or at least question one doesn't. <clears throat> but this is actually a relatively difficult question to address. So I'd like to start off and postulate maybe even a simpler question just to get also our, our feet wet in understanding what we might be able to do with unsupervised machine learning. And I take an image like this, which if you're a colloidal scientist, you see very frequently. And if, you eye, and if you look at this image very carefully, your eyes might pick out that I've got a lot of disorder here and I've got a little bit of order inside this disorder. So I've got a crystal actually popping out of a, out of a fluid. And so one of the things you could ask is, how can I pick out this crystal from the fluid? There's many reasons you might want to do this. You might be an experimentalist and you're following this process. You might be a simulator and you want to see what is the structure that's forming. And there's three basic options you could use. You could design an algorithm by hand that would be able to pick out a crystal structure popping out of a fluid. Or you could use ideas from both unsupervised and supervised machine learning. And we'll see both types of examples as the talk runs out today. But I'm going to focus to begin with just on if you like, the, the simplest way we've been doing it for many years, and then go into how we might address this question from, a from an unsupervised machine learning direction. And so if we look at this, this system here, this system actually I know a fair bit about it. It's hard spheres, and I know that the kinds of structures or the kinds of crystals that might pop out of hard spheres are actually just basically three. I might have particles which look like they're in a face-centered cubic environment. I might have particles that look like they're in a hexagonal close-packed environment or I might have particles that look like they're in a body-centered cubic environment. And so most crystalline particles will have this kind of structure. And then the goal would be to develop an algorithm that's able to, on its own, tell me, okay, which particles look like they're more fluid and which particles look like they're more of one of these crystals. 
there's a, and the first step to doing any kind of any such analysis will be how do I describe that local environment around my particle? And of course, there's many different options that you could have in order to do that. I will talk today about something called bond order parameters, but that's, that's just one of many, many different ways we could describe local environments. And actually, if we are going to talk about machine learning and glasses, one of the things that, that we can work on in the future is how do we describe local environments? How, how do we make good characterizations of the, of the, the, behave, of the region around a particle? But there's also other algorithms that, that people talk about often, common neighbor analysis, templating, et cetera, et cetera. So what is a bond order parameter? A bond order parameter, because it's going to come up a couple of times in this talk, just also so that I have common language with everybody. The idea is we want a local description of the environment or the local density around a particle that captures the symmetry. And I'm a physicist, if I've got local environment that might have symmetry, I, one would say, okay, maybe we should expand this in terms of spherical harmonics. And that's exactly what people did. They took the local density of particles around the particle, they expanded in terms of, uh, of spherical harmonics, and then you create quantities which are rotationally invariant with those, with those, correct, with those characterizations. And so you get mathematically something that looks like this. You get for every spherical harmonic L, you get basically an order parameter that describes how much of that symmetry is around the particle. And that means that if I'm looking at a, around a single particle, I could talk about the L equals 2 symmetry, the L equals 3 symmetry, the L equals 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and keep going. And so I can describe the local environment around my particle with something like a spherical harmonic. Of course, this is just one choice, but I'm going to make this choice so that we have something to work with. If we do this and we take my hard sphere system, and if I go and I run a computer simulation that runs a bulk FCC phase, a bulk hexagonal closed packed phase, a bulk liquid phase, and so the three crystals and a liquid, and I plot it on Q4, Q6, so these are the Q associated with the L equals 2 harmonic and the Q associated with the L equals 6 harmonic, we can actually see that we are quite able to recognize the four different phases in this picture. And so this would be a way of human designing an algorithm that's able to recognize these different environments. But of course, this comes with a serious cost, which is that this algorithm has been trained with the structures that we expect it to, well, trained. We've, we've looked at the structures that we expect, so we're putting in information to, to begin with, saying that the only structures I'm ever expecting to recognize are ones that I know something about. And I'm also making a rather significant, if you like, dimensionality reduction by hand, which is saying, okay, the dimensions that are going to be important are these Q4 and Q6, and I've probably determined this by trial and error. So I know something about the symmetry, so that gives me a starting point, but also I will just be playing with trial and error and seeing, okay, which choices actually give me the best choice. And so one would like to have something that's much more automated than that. So the question is, what would, we, what would be our options if we really don't even know what we're looking for? If I had shown you this picture at the very beginning, but you don't know what structure you're looking for. And that's the kind of the problem we're going to have in supercooled liquids, a problem where we're looking for structural, structural characteristics and we might not look what, know what we're shooting for. So basically, in a, in a sense, we would be looking for an algorithm that's relatively simple and fast, that can autonomously identify distinct local environments without any prior knowledge, and that it's robust. And robust in, I think, this room means we would like an algorithm that, at the end of the day, can't just tell me when a, when a particle is a fluid and when a particle is a crystal, but is maybe even able to find disorder in disorder, so different kinds of disorder in a disordered system. I have no idea of the clock, sorry. Okay. Um, and so there's actually, of course, I'm not the first, there's many people who have tried to address this question. I think some of the earliest work was around 2017 by the group of Pangeotopoulos, where they made some significant contributions. The algorithms that they built for detecting a crystal structure identification or autonomously, um, autonomous crystal structure identification, the original one was very slow. They kind of sped it up, and, but they're still using relatively complex descriptions of the environments. There's also simultaneously one was asking the question, okay, can we, attract, can we use these kinds of algorithms in the context of glassy systems? And actually, again, someone in the audience today has been addressing this, Daniela Koslovich, uh, where they looked at a paper on, address, on assessing the structural heterogeneity of supercooled liquids through community interference. But I'm going to stick with, uh, to me, the simplest kind of case I can have and just walk you through what kind of things we might be able to do in a non-supervised fashion and what are the kinds of algorithms that might pop up. 
And so if we, if we kind of want to design this, a simple way of trying to extract local structure or extract different, different structures, I think there's three key pieces we have to discuss, or at least there's three key pieces we could discuss. One, which is how are we going to describe the local environments? And for, the, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to pretend that what we're using today is the bond order parameters. And by the way, there's no reason to, uh, to assume that those are the best choice, and, I prob and they probably are not. But they're just so that we're all on the same page, we're going to stick with bond order parameters for the moment. Um, we also have to have some way of understanding main features distinguishing the local environments in the system, and that's what we're going to turn into a question of dimensionality reduction. And so what I actually want to spend the next little while, sorry, but I actually want to spend the next little while talking to you guys about our different ways we could do dimensionality reduction. So for part one, we're just going to focus on bond order parameters. We assume that's a done problem, although as I said, we could do lots of different things. Part two, what are, the machine, what are these algorithms looking like and what might they do? And so let's start off with uh, talking about it in terms of a very, very simple system because I think it's always nice to have pictures in your head as you're walking through algorithms. Here's a phase coexistence between a fluid and two different crystals. One is face under cubic and one is hexagonal closed packed. And we're going to, as we go through the various kinds of algorithms, go back to this image. And we would like the algorithm to be able to spontaneously identify these different regions. So as I mentioned, we will start off with a description of the local environments, which are bond order parameters. And then we're going to look at dimensionality reduction. And so what does it mean to say dimensionality reduction? And I think probably most people in this room know, but just in case it's not, you're not familiar with it, here's a really, really simple example. I have this data in two dimensions. And if I look at this data, I say, okay, actually most of the information or most of the scatter is along one axis in this picture. And so one could say, okay, well, if I want to capture most of the important information, probably most of the important information is along this axis here, and then there's some information along this axis. And so I could imagine reducing the dimensionality of this problem from 2D to 1D by focusing on this, on this one line. And this picture where I just take a linear transformation and I rotate my system and I throw out the dimensions which have very little contribution, that's basically principal component analysis. So we rotate the, the coordinate axis, we rotate the coordinate axis until the, the main deviations are in our system, start off along the first principal component and the second principal component, and if I had a many dimensional system, I would keep doing that such that every dimension adds less and less information, and then I can basically reduce my dimensionality with that. So this is a basic linear version of dimensionality reduction that people often use and that will maybe be talked about during this workshop at a later point. Of course, there's data for which a linear transformation is not really necessarily the best way of reducing that data or reducing the information. And so if I took a circle like this, I could draw lines as much as I want, but there's no way I'm going to be able to find a projection for which, or a, a line for which I'm, ca I'm capturing most of the information. But nonetheless, we know that there's a one-dimensional function, cosine of theta, that describes a, a circle. And so the question now the reduction schemes. So going from projection. And of course, I wouldn't be here mentioning this if this was not the case. And so the computer scientists have done beautiful things in the past. And one of the things that they've introduced is something called an autoencoder. I'm just going to walk through in the next few slides what is an autoencoder and how does this allow us to do dimensionality reduction in systems with, um, which have nonlinearities. So dimensionality reduction, in an, uh, we're going to use a neural network to do this, and I will actually tell you guys lots about neural networks later. But for the moment, just assume it's some kind of fit function that we're going to figure out what these actually guys are at some later point. And the starting point of an autoencoder is to do absolutely nothing, which is a bit of a strange statement. But we're going to take all of these cues from my particles and have them coming in here, and I'm going to put a nasty function in between. And the goal of this nasty function is to learn the identity matrix. So it should put out for each cue the same, the same information out that came in, which sounds like it should do absolutely nothing. But the cool part is the way this, or this thing inside is actually designed. And this thing is de inside is designed with, with a so-called bottleneck. And so the idea here is that we take a number of parameters that describe my system. Maybe it's a vector of 24 QLs. And then I push this through something which is much, much smaller, so which has a lower dimensionality. And then try to, using this lower dimensionality, reproduce what I started with. 
And if I'm able to take these cues, push it through a lower dimension, and get back out the same cues, or at least almost the same cues, almost the same description of the system, that means I found a lower dimensional representation for that data. So that's the, uh, the language here, by the way, is that I have input, there's an encoder, there's a bottleneck, so maybe only two, if I had wanted a two-dimensional projection, this would be just two nodes. Then there's a, re yeah, a decoder and an output. And the main point is that the number of nodes here, or the, no the amount of information here, is significantly smaller than the information there. And then at the end of the day, once you've learned this function, or you've learned this nasty function, what do you do with it? You throw half of it out. And the half of it you throw out is the thing on the right, and then you take your input, you, decode, you encode, and you go down through a bottleneck, and that's your, your, encode, that's your, your dimensionality reduction. And so how does this actually look? Well, you go back to your picture of spheres, which I promised you has a fluid and two different crystals in it, and you, for every particle, write down the, the local environment, in this case in terms of bond order parameters, but you could pick whatever you like to do that and then you fit it through this decoder step. And so you fit in the local environment of every particle, you push it through the left, you try to optimize this function such that what comes in comes out, and you repeat until you get a nice optimized function. And then you can ask, then you can throw out everything else and you go down in dimensionality. And so then you, if I have two, if I go down to a dimension of two and I plot every particle now in this lower dimension, my eyes actually see every dot here is one of the particles from the previous picture plotted in this lower dimension. And your eyes already probably see that this thing looks like it has three different regions. There's, there seems to be a, a big heavy density here, a big heavy density there, and a big heavy density there. So if I do a two-dimensional projection of this data, I get something which separates everything into three different groups. So this is uh, two different ways, if you like, of lowering the dimensionality. We just talked about principal component analysis, a linear transformation and an autoencoder which allows for a nonlinear transformation to a lower dimensionality. And then of course, once I have these pictures like this, I would like to be able to group together environments which are similar. And again, if you grab your machine learning textbook, you'll find there's many, many different options. A nice option, or one that we often use, is Gaussian mixture models where you basically just fit this density with a, pile, with a number of Gaussians and you use these Gaussians to determine how many different groups or how many different clusters. And there's arguments to be made why this would be a good algorithm in some cases or why other algorithms would be better in others. So there's for many of these different steps many different choices, but basically regardless of which choice you use, it's trying to group together densities that, that, that kind of are, are collected together or particles which are in the same environment in this picture. And so if we do this and we use the Gaussian mixture models to color our particles, we actually get the following. And so we find that this picture, which looked kind of like it had fluids and crystal, actually has one color here, a different color here, and a different color here. And then we can go by eye and identify which structures we're actually seeing. So that was the, that's this very simple case. Um, so we have now have kind of the, the elements that we wanted. And I just want to point out that Again, if you're doing machine learning, basically for all of these different elements in the Glassy community, we could use a number of different algorithms. We could use a number of different inputs, but I think a lot of the, the outcome will be very similar. Um, I'm guessing, Daniela, I will mention it a little bit later, but for instance, the algorithms that, that were produced in the paper that I mentioned a little while ago and the one that we looked at did, did very different, in some sense, did very different things, but came out with very similar solutions. Um, the next question that we wanted to address, though, was how robust is this algorithm, or uh, is such an algorithm even applicable to the problems that this community is going to be interested in? Not crystals, but supercooled liquids. And so the question is kind of, can we use this algorithm to study supercooled liquids, and can we use such unsupervised algorithms in general to study supercooled liquids? And so the, again, the question that I kind of showed on a previous slide, we have structure here, and is it possible to go from this non, I don't know what this structure is, to some kind of description of what this structure actually looks like, or can I use unsupervised machine learning to kind of get a structural order parameter out of everything? And I wouldn't be mentioning this if it wasn't possible. So to try to address this question, we took the algorithm that we basically just showed you, or you can take the algorithm that we just showed you, and you can apply it to hard spheres and a variety of different systems and ask, what does it do for all of these different glassy systems that we're familiar with? 
So these are three these are three glasses which are based on just binary mixtures, um, binary hard spheres, binary WCA, Weeks, Chandler, Anderson, and Cobb Anderson. And so then the question is, if we take such an algorithm, is it capable of finding structural variations in such a system? And the first step of the algorithm would be to find out what is the dimensionality that you need to go down. And you can say, OK, well, how do we do this? The algorithm is very quick, so you can try a number of different low dimensions, two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. And you can say, when do I not lose a lot of the information and use a threshold for that? It turns out that for hard spheres, we found that we could hold most information in two dimensions for the repulsive weeks Chandler Anderson, also two, but for Cobb Anderson, we couldn't go down to lower than four dimensions. And we also found that in all cases, the algorithm identified two clusters. If we use Gaussian mixture models, we were able to identify two different clusters in actually all three algorithms. So that meant that if we try to ask how many different structural regions could we distinguish or find as different maybe kind of on the order of two although one can ask is it really too different or is it some kind of continuum of structural of structure as you walk through it but at the very least we find structural variation in the system which you can fit very well with two gaussians and you can then look at this so if you have this again in this low dimensional picture you would have two gaussians fi 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 uh, fitting your density and since you have only two Gaussians fitting your density, you can kind of create a one-dimensional order parameter which captures that information. And so this is going into a little bit of my work, but just to show you guys what we could, in principle, do with this. Um, so if we apply this order parameter to, to, for instance, three different systems, again, this hard sphere system, this repulsive Weeks Chandler Anderson, or Kolb Anderson, we find that the algorithm does indeed identify different structural regions. And there's, of course, many other papers out there which say similar things. But the question that still arises is these structural regions, do they say anything about the dynamics? Or is there any connection between what this algorithm would give you and, and the dynamics in the system? So does the structural order parameter correlate with dynamics in some way? And in order to do that, one needs to say, how am I going to quantify the dynamics of my system? And of course, I'm talking to a room of experts. And I think many of you guys know I can quantify the dynamics in a, in a glassy system in many different ways. So one has to make a choice. One possible choice is the dynamic propensity, for instance, where you measure the average dynamics of a single particle. I see all of you. Yeah, yes. Before you come to, to the dynamics, yeah. the dynamics if, if, if then you look at the, at the regions that are identified uh, agnostically with your human eyes, yes. uh, <laughs> do you see something? No. And so that's a really good question. So can we simply by looking at the uh, can we by simply looking at the uh, at the different regions identify structural differ differences? The answer is no. What what one can still do though is ask: Are there other algorithms that are able to pick up structural differences in these regions? Now that we've identified that there's kind of two different clouds or two different groups that maybe we want to look at separately. And then if we do that, I think I still left the slides in. We do see, for instance, uh, if I were to apply topological cluster classification to the two regions, I do see differences in the likelihood of seeing different clusters in the two regions. I, if I look at the differences between Q6, I see very small, not Q6, but the Qs, I see very small differences. But in things like TCC, the differences are pretty strong, to be honest. So I can't do it by eye, but with other algorithms, it's sometimes possible post post-processing to try to then ask what are the differences that are being picked up by this algorithm. But how do you know that the, uh, the difference between the white and the red is important? Before, yeah. before going to the dynamics? Before going to the dynamics, I think the only thing I can say at that point in time, or I think the only thing anyone could say at this point in time is this is within this, within this world of this unsupervised machine learning structural order parameter, the biggest variations it sees. Whether that big variation is an important big variation, I think, is, is the question you have. And I, I don't know a priori that this structural variation is going to have any, an, a, any correlation with the dynamics, and I don't think anyone would. Um, the, the point is, if I were to really blindly ask, what are the biggest structural variations I can find in this system within this world where I've made a lot of choices? I've chosen that I'm going to use bond order parameters to describe the local environment. It's probably the biggest choice I've made, but I've made that choice. What are then the biggest variations I can find? And the only thing this algorithm can tell me is these are the biggest differences I find. It's really a post version to say, OK, are these structural variations important in terms of the dynamics of the system? Or? Not the dynamics of structure. I'm, I'm OK. Sure, like Olivia wanted to ask a question. OK, sorry. I mean, if you go to 
said the high temperature of liquid and you apply the algorithm, don't you find the same picture? And then how do you know that this picture is really telling you something about glassy About glassy systems, I think that you, you, I'm going to say that there's two interesting questions there. One, which is if I were to take an algorithm like this and apply it to, let's say, a metastable liquid that was forming, that was going towards crystal, would I see a variation? The answer is you see some, the answer I can tell you already is that you see some variation. And then you can even ask questions, are, are these differences in the metastable liquid saying something about where crystallization might happen in the future? So you could, in that world, start asking, are the differences I see in the liquid important for another process that's happening in there? Um, I would say that in this context, I'm going to go with the argument almost the other way around, which says we don't know a priori that these structural regions we see are very important, but we can then calculate the dynamics of the system and we find some correlation. And so one could then say, okay, maybe there's some importance there, but I would go in that direction. I would also love to know the time because I, my phone. Okay, that's, per that's actually perfect. Okay, so then does the structural parameter correlate with the dynamics? And so then we can actually dig it. One could actually dig into this. And I know there's many different ways one could talk about the dynamics. And no matter how we do it, we're going to lose some kind of information. One option is the dynamic propensity, but I'll mention a few others in a second. What is the dynamic propensity for anyone who's not familiar? The idea is that I take my system, I make many, many copies of my system. I start the simulation with, with a scatter of velocities each time. And then I measure on average how far does a particle travel. And so that's just at some time t. And so I measure a dynamic propensity for different times, so for different d distances and time in my system. And for every particle, I get an average displacement over that time based on a scattering of its velocities. And that's what's called the dynamic propensity. You can then, in principle, well, you could color your particles according to the dynamic propensity. That's not so important. You could also kind of ask, okay, what does the dynamic propensity tell us kind of on a more global scale? So if I were to globally average the dynamic propensity as a function of time, so we have a function of time on the x-axis and we have on the y how far on average a particle travels after that amount of time, and we see three regimes that we are expecting. You see a ballistic regime, you see a caging regime, and you see a diffusive regime. And so that's the characteristics of the global um, dynamic propensity, but of course what we're interested in is the dynamic propensity on a single particle level so that I can correlate that with the local structure in the system or so that could be correlated. And as I mentioned, there's no reason why the dynamic propensity is, is the best choice and there's a lot of different people in literature who might have different opinions on this. One that's used uh, by Andrea Liu's group often is a rearrangement probability. Um, there's also by Patty Royal, by Tanaka's group, Lifetimes of clusters has been used. There's also things like single trajectory displacement. And so there are many different ways one could attempt to find a way of identifying what are the local, what, are, what is a local description of the dynamics. But for the moment, we're just going to focus on the dynamic propensity. And so we can then color the particles, as I said, according to their structure. And we can also color the particles, for instance, according to the dynamic propensity. And of course, you have to choose when you're going to color them because the dynamic propensity has to be calculated at, at various times. And so if I look at the point where the correlation is the strongest, I would get a picture that looks something like this. So the dynamic propensity here is colored white as slow particles, red are fast particles, structural order parameter from white to red as well. And we can just by eye say, OK, I see some similarity, but of course, that's just that's just a visual perspective and one could also go back and say okay what is the, really the correlation and so in machine learning language we often calculate correlations between two di different variables here we're, cal we're calculating the correlation between our structural order parameter and the dynamic propensity and we do this again for these three different models and we find reasonable correlations I would say but not very strong correlations so all of the times on this axis are given in terms of tau alpha for the glass. And we see peaks for hard spheres around 0.6, peaks for the, for the repulsive WCA, so the binary mixture of repulsive par soft repulsive particles around 0.5, and significantly worse for Cobb Anderson, which is actually a rather poor correlation in my mind. And so one can ask the question, what is going on there and why? Why is Cobb Anderson so much more difficult? Maybe we can address that question a little bit towards the end of this talk. 
But these are at least the kinds of correlations we get between this choice, the dynamic propensity, and this structural order parameter, which is popping out of the unsupervised machine learning. One thing I want to point out, because people talk about this very often, and I think it's one of the things that the machine learning or that, that people who are calculating correlations use very loosely, but it's probably good to recognize. Very often, there's two different, ki there's two different kinds of correlations that are usually used in most, uh, most systems. There's what's called the Spearman correlation, and the Spearman correlation is useful on a problem like this where we have, for instance, a dynamic propensity which we're trying to correlate with a structural order parameter. Both of them we're expecting to be hopefully monotonically increasing, and so then you actually first rank your variables and then you calculate the correlation between the rankings of your variables. So this is the so-called Spearman correlation, and then you have the Pearson correlation, which is the one we're probably all more familiar with, which is just the, the standard core, which is just the standard correlator between two things. It turns out in this problem, by the way, we've done both Pearson and, and um, Spearman, and you get the same answer, so it wouldn't have made any difference. But the nice, the advantage, if anyone cares about a Spearman correlation for some situations, is that if I had two variables which dep which are both kind of monotonically increasing as a function of something, then I could get a high Spearman correlation even if they're not linearly dependent on each other. And so, in principle, you can get correlations in, that, uh, in these kinds of variables in a nice way. Um, one could also ask in other ways, and this goes to the question you had a little bit earlier, is there a reason to think, to think that the structural order parameter means something outside of the fact that it correlated a little bit with the dynamics? Here we have the probability that a particle is part of the red cluster as a function of, well, in the case of hard spheres, as a function of the packing fraction, and in the case of the other two models, as a function of the temperature. And we know that in hard spheres, my system gets more glassy as I move to the right, and in the other two models, it's getting more glassy as I move to the left. And we definitely find that one of these populations is increasing as we supercool, the, as we go towards more supercooling. So the population of particles in one of these clusters is, is decreasing in one direction as we go towards more supercooling. This goes to the question Olivier asked, which is, can I then go back and ask, are there structural differences that are visible? And so here, we're looking at the different Qs. So for the three different models, so Q, the average value of Q in the two different regions, in the red and the white cluster, as a function of this order parameter L, so the spherical harmonic. And you see small differences between the two clusters, but they're actually really small. And so the, the, if I try to use the bond order parameters to distinguish the behavior in these two different regions, it's actually not so easy to do. On the other hand, you can use something called topological cluster classification, which I don't have time to explain exactly what it is. I hope people kind of understand. The idea is that you look for clusters that are common in your system, and people have gone through a lot of effort to identify what these different clusters might be. So this whole ridiculous list is a list of different clusters of particles you could imagine seeing in your system. I think the, the message I want because is that the green ones generally are polytetrahedral and the blue ones generally are square pyramidal <laughs> approximately. So that's kind of how I group them. And you can see that in that case there is a correlation between the, the red, the, yeah, the, this P red or the probability of being in the red cluster, we see, for instance, that the white particles have a tendency to have a lot of polytetrahedral environments, and the fast or the red particles tend to have a lot of square pyramidal environments. And so that's actually a better way of recognizing the differences in these two regimes. Similar to the dynamics, though, the differences are, are more dramatic for hard spheres and the repulsive WCA, and they almost dis they don't disappear for Carl Anderson, but they're much, much, much weaker for Cobb Anderson. Um, and this is actually consistent with what's been seen in literature, but that's not so, so important in a number of papers. So I just wanted to emphasize before we change topics a bit that there are many different choices for all of these three categories. This was one set of choices. I hope it gives you guys a flavor of the kinds of things we could do with unsupervised machine learning and what, this can, what can be done there. One uh, interesting point that goes into structure, which is what the algorithm is really not capable of doing for sure, is at the moment it's not capable of recognizing very finite structures. So here we have a superparticle of colloids, which is made up of bulk green particles, and then particles in between, which are just planar particles, so kind of 2D order and one-dimensional order, so a mixture of three-dimensional, two-dimensional, and one-dimensional order. 
and the algorithm as it was is not able to recognize the, all of these three different types of environments. My group has been doing a lot of work on this, and we are able to to push it using a very different kind of using very different kinds of machine learning to be able to recognize indeed the one-dimensional structures, the 2D structures, and the 3D structures. But none of what I mentioned now is actually capable of doing that. So if one wants to get to even more finite or even more strong structural differences, we will have to play around with these kinds of algorithms even further. I think. Sorry, can you yeah. Yeah. I put the colors to do it. Yeah. No, you're fully right, and so we were hoping that this would work better. Um, I think that there's a there's a couple of problems. The one, which is that the way the queues are set up at the moment, they tend to be doing a fairly b big job of averaging local, uh, looking at the average local environments, or looking at a chunk of the local environments, and of course, one D has much less of that than 2D, has much less of that than 3D. Also, it turns out that the type of dimensionality reduction we're doing is not helping our cause. And so we can only get this with using something called, which I don't have time to talk about today, but something called a variational autoencoder. And so we, we take the system to a completely different, uh, well, not completely, but a somewhat different perspective. So yeah. But I wish it had, yeah. So this was a bit uh, sad whenever we first saw it, but. Um, it is true. I saw a hand at the back. Yeah. Well, it's a uh, high percent question. Okay. So what, what is the neural network that you are using in the open encoder? What is the uh, neural so network? The it's it's just normal layers. Yeah, so it's just okay. normal layers, and there's nothing. Yeah. It's uh, also small. Okay. Um, so it's basically some density, I guess, in the open encoder. So yeah, and something. small. <laughs> yes. No, yeah, no, I completely, I, com I completely understand. And so it, maybe I can rephrase it. Maybe I can even expand on the question. So one of the other issues is that, of course, there's many less particles that participate in the edges, in the the lines, than in the planes, than in the bulk. And that does play a role as well. And so, it's making it worse. We can add more data simply by taking more snapshots and adding more information to the system. But even that doesn't completely solve our problem. But yeah. Good point. OK, so conclusions for this little bit. Um, super well, I should have said unsupervised. But anyway, we've introduced a simple, fast, and easy to implement unsupervised algorithm for autonomously recognizing local structural motifs. And I think that these kinds of unsupervised algorithms generally might have some significant potential in the end in trying to recognize structural differences in glassy systems. I have to admit, I think we're very far from there. I mean, we're looking at correlations that were numbers like 0 0.6, or maybe 0 0.4 in the case of Cobb Anderson, or even worse. And so I think that they're, they are interesting, but I think that there's still a lot to do. And I think that there's still a lot of potential for recognizing structure in this way. But then the next question that is uh, quite obvious is actually to go the other way and say, OK, we actually know something about the dynamics of my system. So let's actually not throw all of that information out. Let's use that and try to fit the dynamics of the system with structure in some kind of way. And so how might we want to, how might you want to go about that, doing that? And that brings us to this topic of supervised machine learning. And basically, the genre of supervised machine learning says, I have data which is tagged in some way, and I want to create some function that takes me from structure to, say, dynamics in this case. And the main applications are generally something like fitting or classification. And so in the case of fitting the dynamics, a picture that you could have in your head from a machine, from a, a glassy system would be that I focus on a single particle, I take a look at its local environment, and I try to fit the future dynamics of that particle using just the local structure of that particle. And that would be the, and the question that one would have then is what should be this function? And how can, well, what should be the inputs to the function and what should be the function? So how are we going to describe the local environment around the particle and what will be the function? But before we do that, just a quick intermezzo on fitting and machine learning, because I was asked to hopefully give you guys a little bit of information about the different kinds of algorithms. And so maybe we spent a few minutes on supervised machine learning. <coughs> 
So what is the general problem that we want to address? We want to find some function that takes some input data x and outputs the value f of x, matching as closely as possible the desired value. So I want to fit a function. And basically, as I said, there's two kinds of things we might be able to do with that. We could just fit the function, or we might want to classify. So an example of classification might be, I've got a picture and I want to, know, I want to learn to recognize a dog from a cat. So I want to, to classify different objects. Or I want to recognize a particle as environment A, B, C, D, something in this ballpark. And as a point of interest, just for anybody looking, the vector x or the input x contains a number of, uh, in principle, multiple numbers. It can be many dimensions, and hence it represents a vector. And y can also be multidimensional. So there's no guarantee that the function I'm fitting is just, you know, uh, the dynamic propensity. It could be, in principle, a vector that I'm trying to fit with this function. And so what would be the simplest way of designing such a function, the simplest way? which I think all of us go back to our, can all go back to our undergraduate textbooks and find, which would be just be linear regression. We say, OK, I have a function x, which is going to be some bias plus some weights times that, the, the vector x. And so given some training data, how do we optimize the, the bias and the weights to minimize something which we're going to call a loss function? And so in all, of, in all of supervised machine learning, we will generally talk about a loss function that we want to minimize. And the question is, what might this loss function be? And a very commonly used loss function is the squared error, which just says, OK, the value of f of x minus what it should be, and then squared. And I sum that up. So if you like, it's, yeah, squared error. So I get the predicted minus the actual measured, and I square that. And I want that to be as small as possible. That would be a standard loss function. And the nice thing about linear regression, of course, is that you can show that it's purely analytic. So there is an answer to this question, and there's a unique answer to this question. You can use your linear algebra <laughs> textbook and figure out what actually is the solution to this problem. And there's a unique value of b's and w's that solve this problem. So on some levels, it's very, very powerful. And it has a nice fact that if I do it and if someone else does it three times on the same computer, we get the same answer three times, which is quite nice. <clears throat> and so you could imagine that you have data, which has some shape like this, for instance, and you want to fit it. One of the things that my undergrads would immediately say is, OK, but I can't fit that with a straight line. But actually, linear regression is, of course, not, rec is not restricted to being able to fit things with a straight line. Because of course, in linear regression, you can add a pile of polynomial terms, if you like, or a pile of different terms that describe your system. And so I can do linear regression, where in addition to having a constant and a linear term, I can have, for instance, x, x squared, x cubed. And so I can do all of this with simple linear regression, which again is deterministic. It has a unique solution. And so it can be quite powerful. And so this is, if people talk about linear regression, this is at least one of the, this is what basically they're talking about. Um, one of the topics that I suspect will come up in a very similar way at this workshop which is also based on a linear technique, is something called support vector machines. And I <laughs> wanted to mention this because I think um, this might come up in the talk, uh, in the discussion of softness later. But there's also other kinds of linear methods that can, be, that can be used. And one of them that's often used for classification, but can be also generalized in other ways, in other ways, starts off with particles which are labeled into two groups. So for instance, I have particles which are blue and particles which I label red. And these particles have, in some dimension, some, uh, yeah, some grouping, if you like. And so then the goal is, in, in support vector machines, to find a line or a hyperplane that separates as best as possible the blue particles from the red particles, or the blue dots from the red dots. And so you look for a dividing line or dividing hyperplane that divides as best as possible these two. And this is, again, a linear-like technique. <coughs> The loss function becomes a little bit more complicated generally for support vector machines because basically it has a term which tries to have the blue particles on this side of the black line, the red particles on this side of the red line, and it tries to choose the plane such that also even in the vicinity of the line there's as few particles as possible. And so this is the, the idea behind a support vector machine in case anybody hears about it later. So those are two different kinds of linear ways of fitting, well, linear classification and ways of fitting functions. Of course, another thing, oh yeah, sorry. I had to just popped up. I think this will be used in the definition of softness uh, by Andrea Liu's group later on. Um, of course, 
it's not possible always to fit all of our functions with just linear regression or with just a linear combination of the variables that we could be interested in. And so then that brings the one to the discussion of what is a neural network, because that's actually one of the very common things that show up in machine learning. I have to admit, when I first saw one of these nodes, I wondered, okay, what is actually inside a node? Whenever people draw all of these nodes connected to each other, what are they actually, what is inside that function? And so anytime you see a node in machine learning, what the people are actually looking at is you take a pile of inputs, you take these inputs, you multiply them by weights, you add a bias to them, you sum all of the inputs, and then you put this as an output, and this output then is created by applying some nonlinear function to that summation. So a node, anytime you write generally a, a node in a neural network, looks something like this. Weights, biases, which are trained by the neural network. <clears throat> and so you have input. Normally there's some kind of input. It might be a vector. It gets sent to a pile of nodes. And in principle, if I had a really small um, neural network, it would then just try to create some output out of that whole thing. And just for language, often to describe this n the network structure, you would say 1 by 4 by 1, because the number of nodes that's sitting in the middle of this is something like 1. And so one could ask, well, what would the then output function of this very simple network be? We would have a function f of x, which has some bias and some weights associated with then again the action of these nodes. And so you can also write down, for instance, what this, what this function really is that you're solving for. Um, how would we solve it? Well, you would start off with some training data sets. For a simple function, you would need to know what is x and what is f of x, so what, is, what are you training it with? You optimize the weights and biases, and this can be done with a variety of methods, for instance, stochastic gradient descent methods, but there's a variety. And then at the end of the day, you want to check how well the output of your network fits with your desired outcome. And so usually you hold back some of your data so you can then afterwards go and say, OK, if I were then to, to see how well this fit works on my data, I can then check at that point in time. And so just as a very simple example, you could take, for instance, a sine function and say, can I fit it with a very simple neural network? And if you try to fit a sine function with a very simple neural network without doing too much effort, I don't get a great fit. And so one of the things that one could ask is how can we then make the neural network perform a little bit better? And that brings us to the possibility of instead of just having one layer in the neural network, having multiple layers in the neural network. And so here we would have a 1 by 4 by 4 by 1 neural network. And the nice thing about that <coughs> is that it turns out that by adding layers in this direction, instead of adding them in this direction, very often it can make your, func your fitting better. So as an example, we take the sine function and we try to fit it with a neural network which had a structure 1 by 100 by 1, and you get behavior that's not super great. On the other hand, you take it with a network structure of 1 by 5 by 5 by 1, and you can fit the data much, much better. The number of parameters that are being fit on the left is 301, and the number of parameters that are being fit on the right is 486. And so there's also just many less parameters to optimize. This was for the people who really have no experience at all in the audience, but I thought it was good to try to give some introduction to what these words mean whenever we use them and what the pictures mean. So let's go back to our friends that we had earlier and say, OK, how could we use this to then apply it to problems like structure and dynamics? And here I'm just going to worry about recognizing different structure, because we've already seen that today. And so we went through human design and unsupervised design, but we could also ask, can we use supervised machine learning in a way that would, that would solve this problem? And so, for instance, if I look at colloidal systems, in principle, there's many, many different structures that they could form, but I could, in principle, no idea why I went further, I could, in principle, simulate different structures and try to learn what are, how, what are the differences. And so we can take for instance, just a very simple neural, oh, a relatively simple neural network, which would then have again bond order parameters as the input. Although that's my choice, that's not a, that's not necessarily the best choice. You have some kind of nonlinear function in between, which is a neural network, and this nonlinear, this neural network tries to learn whether this crystal is crystal A or crystal B or fluid or whatever you want it to be. And you do this by starting off simulating crystal 1 and crystal 2 and crystal 3, or taking configurations that correspond to crystal 1, crystal 2, and crystal 3, and you use those as your input for fitting this function. And again, just to repeat, you simulate known structures, you optimize the fit, 
and you, trust on, you test on some data that has not been part of your fitting behavior. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, no, of course. So, see, uh, so here the input is for a given particle all the list of Q or is yes. it for the all the... Uh, no, so for here we're looking on a single particle level. Okay. I give the Qs for a single particle, a whole list of them, and then I try to, to learn whether that specific particle looks like it's more in crystal A or crystal B or crystal C or okay. whichever. Because yes. I, the, the, I mean, what you want to do is to recognize, I mean, for a given particle, whether it is in a subregion which is more like... Because otherwise you could also give... You just want to recognize all the all the, all the particles. Exactly. And I agree completely. So I, I, in, in a sense, you're, in a sense, maybe I could ask the question in a different way. If I'm looking at distinguishing global structure, is there a difference between recognizing global structure and re recognizing local structure? And recognizing global structure is much easier than recognizing on a single particle, you know, trying to recognize what a single particle environment might be in compared to trying to recognize that this whole box is at the moment in a cesium chloride structure, for instance. So I'm worried about the simple, the, the, the more complex problem, which is how do I recognize on a single particle level? This gets us closer to supercooled liquids, I hope. Yeah, of course. What is the size of the particles? Like, what size should we be careful? Is there any imagination so of the size of the structures? Of the structures? The size of the structures. That's a, so not so much the size of the particle, but the size of the structure in, in say, units of particle. So we've done this for structures with, yeah, I think that the, it's a bit of a combination then of what you use as input and what you're and what you're hoping to be able to get out. Of course, if I want to recognize different structures, I need to at least have information that's big enough or that's far enough out to recognize that this is different than than another one. And of course, the bigger the superstructure that I'm trying to recognize, the harder that problem will be. Um, and so then if you if you're looking at you know information around a first shell or maybe a second shell the bond order parameters will work very well if you want something that's more complex then one needs to start looking at different ways of encoding the environment of a particle in the system that's a good question yeah is it possible to get a transition in an output so you have now discrete uh, outcome is it possible to get for example with a certain Probability. probability, that's wow. basically usually what you get. I make, I'm make. So I've oversimplified here a little bit, but usually there's probabilities and then you turn those probabilities into probably A, B, C, or D. But yeah, no, the, the general is for more probability oriented. Um, so we've done that and this works actually very well. This has been applied to just to, to binary systems, to systems which are anisotropic. It's been applied to many, many different systems. In particular, we've tried it for all the different crystals that are known to form in binary hard sphere systems, but other people have also used this in the past as well. So it's something that's quite powerful for just identifying different structures. And so my point there was just what can we do with neural networks and why and, and what how might these work? And Olivier's hands is up, yeah. Yeah. With this one, does it find the same things? It works as it's well? Yeah, so actually in, the, in these systems that we're looking at, yeah, it works actually quite well. So we've also tried that. It also does something similar here. So what you're seeing here is crystal, crystal, and interface. And the interface are identified as fluid particles. The unsupervised is good at this and this. And it has a hard time with knowing what to do at the interface because the same problem with the edges and the line defects. So it's going to likely color these particles either purple, either purple or brown and not give us these liquid particles. So it's going to have trouble at the interface. Or no trouble, it's going to give a different solution <laughs> with the particles that are sitting there. And so now we turn our attention back to supercool liquids. And then I'm going to look again at the time because I'm curious. OK, so I'm an hour in. <laughs> it's all good, yeah. I'm not stressed about it. I will keep going. And now we go back to supercool liquids, and so fitting the dynamics, so structure and dynamics, where we want to, to fit a function. And here we're going to say, OK, now I have a, not a classification problem, but I have a fit problem. I want to fit what it will be the dynamics of a particle. And for simplicity's sake, maybe we're going to hang out with the dynamic propensity for the moment. But of course, you could choose different quantities to do that with. And of course, there's people who've tried this in the past. Um, I think that there was a, I think, I'm not sure if the talk will happen. Victor Babst was supposed to give a talk on some of the work that they did, I think, in this genre. But I think it got canceled. If I'm, we'll see what happens, if it happens or not. But in any case, 
I think that there was a very nice, interesting paper that came out <coughs> on unveiling the predictive power of static structure in glassy systems. But then they used a rather fancy algorithm to do it, which is something called a graph neural network. And they compared, say, for instance, what could be done with correlating the dynamics or correlating the dynamic propensity at different times with prediction in the kolb anderson mixture. And if you guys remember, in the unsupervised machine learning, the worst one I had was kolb anderson by far. And so then my, the numbers for unsupervised were somewhere down here. And if you look at the graph neural networks, they're actually a significant improvement in a sense on being able to predict how far a particle on average will travel based on its structure. And so one of the questions that we had, so it turns out these, I will talk about what the graph neural network is in a second, but one of the questions that we had was what did a graph neural network do right? And in order to answer that, I think it's important for everybody here to know what a graph neural network is, because I think regardless of whether this talk happens, they'll probably be mentioned before this week is out. So this is a short, incomplete introduction to GNNs, graph neural networks. What are they? The idea is that I take my box of particles and I encode my box of particles into some kind of graph where I've got particles at the vertices and then edges that connect the particles. And in principle, I might, for instance, if I were to do something like what Victor Bops did, you might put, for instance, the coordinates of the particle at the vertices and maybe a vector between the particles at the edges. You're not restricted to doing that, though. In principle, you could encode at each node and edge a vector of information that you think is important. And so you could even, for instance, use bond order parameters at the nodes and use this as the input that you're giving this network. But the idea is you connect, you take all of your particles, you add, a, you create a graph out of it, and you have information vectors at the nodes and vectors at the edges that describe information you care about in the system. And then you encode the nodes. You use a neural network, so these things that we had a few slides ago, to encode each node and each edge into a vector. And so you take that information and then you, you project that into a vector using a neural network. And of course, that neural network comes with its own weights and biases that will be fit at the end of this. All of the next slides are going to be creating more and more layers of weights and biases that need to be fit as we, create, as we build this graph neural network. So now we have a graph, particles at edges, sorry, particles at nodes, edges between particles, and information associated with the structure at those points. And then what does a graph neural network do? A graph neural network then does two kinds of updates. One which is called an edge update, where I take the information on an edge and the nearby nodes. I create a ne neural network that takes that information and projects that back down onto an edge. So I'm going to, to take the information around an edge, use that to, to create a, a new set of information on that edge. And then we do the same thing with the nodes. We get the information on a node and the edges around it and maybe even the nodes around it. And we put all of that into yet another neural network, which projects the node onto a node. And so once I've done that, I, can, I get new values of edges and new values of nodes. And I can, of course, do that again. So I can recursively update the nodes and update the edges. And each of these updates of nodes and edges, in principle, could come with weights and biases that are associated with it. It might be possible that I use the same weights and biases each time, which is actually the option that was used in the paper by Victor Baptist. And there's a few other choices that can be made along the lines. But the main gist of it is that I take the behavior, I take the information around the edges, and I add them to the information at the node, and I get a new value for the node, and the same thing for the edge. And of course, what's happening as I'm doing that is that each node and edge now incorporates information not just about that node and edge, but about further away. But it doesn't contain it about exact further away. It kind of takes it in in an average sense, because all of these things are being dumped back onto the node as that happens, or on the edge. And then we repeat this. As I said, we can do this edge nodes updates um, node updates as well. And then we end up with, yeah, kind of recursively pulling information from further and further away in kind of a bit of an average sense as it's moving along this trajectory, as it's moving. And then at the end of the day, we use a neural network decoder that takes the node information and predicts, for instance, in our world, the propensity. We could predict any other thing, but we're going to fix, we want to predict the propensity at the end of the day. So we have only one last neural network that uses that to predict the, the propensity. And of course, this comes with a heap of fit parameters. So if you do, for instance, the work that was, if you follow, for instance, the work that was in the paper 
of nature physics, you end up with about 70,000 fit parameters once you've done this whole set of updates. So you get a very, very, very big function <laughs> that describes the behavior of this system. So this is what, in my mind, a graph neural network is in kind of a five minute introduction. I hope that that helped people a little bit. But I take a graph, I map it to itself several times, and I pull information from further and further in as I do this. And so then, this is just a standard Pearson correlation, and so then they measured the correlation between their predictions and time. And you can take it basically, it's not exactly linear, but the same result is linear, but very close support vector machines would give you something like this, and graph neural network clearly beats it. And this is the work by Babst. And so then the question that we had is, because we understand that the structure of the neural networks is to take information from further and further away, is there a way that we can encode that in even simple order parameters and then use those simple order parameters to fit the dynamics of the system? And again, this is not by no means the best way you could possibly imagine. I'm sure there's people in this room who will come up with better options, but this is what we uh, ended up asking. Incorporate this recursive architecture of the GNN into local descriptions of the environment around a particle. Oops. And so then we went to radio functions, which were just kind of standard, standard radio functions. They tell me about the likelihood of seeing a particle at a certain distance. Angular functions, which have to do with the spherical harmonics again. So standard radial and angular descriptors. But then the trick here was that in addition to using standard radial and angular descriptors that look around the environment of the particle, we now start averaging them. And so for every, for every particle, I can look at not just its behavior, but I can look at the average of the behavior of its neighbors. And so I can create a first generation of descriptors, which is coming from the behavior of the descriptor without being averaged, plus all of the descriptions of the neighbors that are in the first shell or that are one away from it. And of course, if I can do that once, there's nothing that stops me from being able to do that over and over again. And similar to the way that the graph neural network was incorporating in kind of an average sense information from further and further away, these descriptors as you go up in generations are incorporating information from further and further away. And so this was our idea. And but maybe it's yeah. a question. No, of course. The averaging procedure, is it the same that uh, like uh, Hajime Tanaka has done uh, when they did the same exercise? Is it the same kind of course screening? It's a similar kind of, yeah, it's a very similar course ki kind of course screening. It's also very similar. Is it the same? I think that the, fir the first generation is the same, yes. The first generation is the same. Is the same, yeah. Um, brain dead. Yeah, there. And so you can go out to nth generation in principle. And so then the, the question is, what can we do with these? What can we do once we have these order parameters that describe this environment in, in many generations? And we thought, OK, instead of using a complicated form of fitting, we're just going to use a, a linear regression, which is, again, something that's deterministic and which is quick and which has a lot less parameters. And so if we do that, so fit using standard linear regression. And what you actually see as you start adding linear regression is that linear regression does with just the first shell of neighbors or with just the first uh, normal radial and angular descriptors would do about the same as, support, as the support vector machines. But as we start adding averaging from further and further away, so as we start average, ad adding this information from a further and further distance, then we get actually up to an agreement which is not completely agreeing with the, with the graph neural network, but is actually very much approaching the result from the graph neural network. So yeah. the length scale over which you average is fixed? The length scale over which we've played with it a lot, and it doesn't matter too much. Because what Tanaka showed is that if you, for any given time yeah. scale, there's an optimal length scale over which you should Yes, and we didn't play with that. And you can actually yeah. get quite a bit. Of an improvement. If you could go up. A bit up. No, I agree with you. So this was the, this is this this is the stupid version which goes we are doing one fixed averaging over all distances rather than making Yeah, you're completely right. I suspect so too by the way. But this was just as a proof of principle that it kind of works. Um, so just to kind of summarize, uh, what have we done? So you have we can kind of, you know, encode what's in a graph neural network but then in a much simpler way a system with maybe 100 parameters, the computational resources of fitting this thing, 1,000 parameters of linear regression versus 70,000 parameters of this graph neural network. The computational resources are, of course, tremendously smaller, so we can do this on a laptop, and it's a little bit easier to interpret. I would do want to point out, though, that this realization of the graph neural network 
didn't add any physics to the nodes. So the, the, the way that they encoded it was in some sense the simplest you could possibly imagine. Where are my particles? What are the vectors between them? And let's try to get the machine to do as much as we possibly can, which is an interesting direction, versus kind of the absolute opposite, where you say, OK, I'm going to put in as much as I possibly can and have the machine do as little as I can. So these are kind of at opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, we also tried on the, la on the last slide, I think, of content to say, OK, well, there's, that comparison was not completely fair because the graph neural network was trying to do something much, much harder, in a sense, than what the, the, these average order parameters were trying to do. So we went back to our friend the binary hard sphere system, and we used the radial and angular descriptors, and we even put those in at the nodes of the graph neural network. So instead of having the graph neural network having only things like positions, we put in information associated with the local structure, and then we compared linear regression neural networks and graph neural networks, linear, regression, linear regression and neural networks of the three generations of descriptors, and graph neural networks with only the first generation because this averaging happens automatically as you apply the graph neural network over and over again, and we actually found that, again, linear regression performed essentially just as well as the graph neural networks, and so there was not really a big benefit to doing this once we had figured, once we had used these Order parameters. Um, I would like to point out, yeah, linear regression works still extremely well. What we also found that I thought was interesting was that neural networks actually turned out to be the hardest to train and to, the hardest to make work. So the fact that graph neural networks are taking in information about the whole system seems to be a huge benefit and even win, or at least even simplify things over neural networks. And so this is, I think, an important, uh, at least, observation from that. And that brings me to kind of my, conclu my almost conclusion, which is where do I think we're headed? And I think that where we're headed will be discussed a lot over the next five days. But to me, a big important point is what can we learn from all of these studies? So if we're fitting dynamics, what, are, what is the physics that we really get out of this? What are we learning about glassy systems as we're doing that? And I think a message that I always want to make is don't forget the physics. We should try to put in as much as we can. And I think there's been some gorgeous work even just thrown on the archive in the last uh, week and a half or two weeks on doing new kinds of fitting that I think will be discussed here, which puts in more physics of what we know about glassy system. And so, yeah, I think there'll be lots of, top lots of great talks on these topics in the coming couple of days. Um, the work I talked about today was mostly work by Emanuele Boettini, who did a lot of it, but I have a new PhD student, Rinska Alkamata, who started up on glassy stuff again in my group. She's here visiting, and a lot of the work was done with a collaboration by, with Frank Smallenberg and Giuseppe Fulpi in France at CNRS, and uh, yeah, just conclusions in case you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Laura, for this great introduction to yeah, machine learning classes. I, I particularly enjoyed the small, uh, the small introduction of machine learning <laughs> itself for the people who are maybe have not yet worked with. Uh, let's. Otherwise, the people online have no chance to follow. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for this great talk. Um, I have a question about the first part. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I understood correctly, the, your machinery with the autoencoder followed by this Gaussian mixture model yeah. leads you to kind of a binary classification, sort of yeah. white <laughs> and red. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's a deeper reason for that. Is that something that you put in or is that something that works best? What happens if you try to allow more possibilities. Is there something that you can yeah, comment so on? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And so I think this is something we've spent a lot of time thinking about. But so we have this, this yeah, if you like, this low dimensional, let's say, in two, let's say two dimensional density, if we look at hard spheres. And the question is, are there really two, is it really best fitted with something like two Gaussians with, a, with a, an inter, well, with a, how to say that? Is it really that there's kind of two populations? Is, is that the best mm -hmm. description, or is that just a, a reasonable description if the only tool I have available is you know, fitting this with Gaussians? Um, we've played a bit with it. So there's something called the Bayesian information criteria. I'm not sure if you're super familiar with it, but mm -hmm. it gives you basically a contrast between, or it's a, it's a fight between the number of parameters in your system and the, um, yeah, the model, your model, if you like. And so then. This gives you two. This says that two clusters kind of fit best, and so for all three models. And mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. I can't remember if I put that in there. I think it was up here. 
Mm -hmm. um, but the truth of the matter is I find that a very, very interesting question because the histogram is actually fairly broad. It doesn't have a nice, um, yeah, it doesn't have a nice dip in the middle. Mm. Um, it fits best with two Gaussians, but that's a separate, uh, that's a separate point. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure is the honest uh, answer, and I find it I find the question very interesting. Okay. Is there really two populations? Could there be more populations? Is it just one? Is it just one continuous um, structure that's changing in in the system? Uh, Rinske and I have spent a ridiculous amount of time playing with that over the last little while, but I'm still not sure. I'm fully yeah. convinced about the, what the answer would be, to be honest. Okay. Olivier, or I'm I'm <laughs> I should. Yes, I mean, just because you show these curves again, is there some information to get from them? I mean, the fact that, for instance, in some case the minima is really well pronounced and in the other case not, I think or it's growing a lot? I mean, yeah, for example, so for the heart failure, it's growing it's on the... If it's well pronounced, then you can at least say that, that, that it's a much better, that it's a better choice. Um, I think in this case, I'm not... Two is the best I can do. And we've played with the parameters, we've played with the dimensionality, we've played with all sorts of things. We always end up with two, which is uh, reproducible. But I might, I'm wondering if it has to do with also the way that we describe the local structure. And so whether we're kind of getting that out of the fact that we're using the bond order parameters the way we are and that the local structure that we capture is the type of local structure we have. And so I think this might be as much a consequence of that as it is of, of really the glass. But I'm not sure is the honest answer. Because I mean, comparing the hard sphere and the Cobanderson, it's almost the opposite, right? Yes. This the Cobanderson would agree to have maybe more. Oh, in that sense, clusters. You mean while we, the hard yeah. spheres would definitely refuse to have more cluster, but maybe it's only one. Yes, I so, agree. So I mean, does it say something about the structure in itself? I kind of think that you're right. I think there's also another feature of Cobanderson that I'm slowly thinking is is very relevant, which is. I think if I want, I think at the end of the day, if I want to describe the behavior of Cobb Anderson well, I'm going to need to know information about fairly far away. Um, we get that in it, and there's all sorts of little hints of that information. So if you do the, the supervised machine learning that we do with the recursive algorithms, in hard spheres we can get away with two with two levels of recur well with one level of recursion or even two levels of recursion. Cobb Anderson, we have to always go one more. So we, we always, for anything we've tried with Kolb Anderson, pretty much always requires that we, we look a little further out if we want to know and get a good estimate. And so my, my feeling is that's what's going on a little bit and that it has to do with the bond order parameters there. But I think Kolb Anderson, I need to talk about bigger structures if I want to say what's going on. And hard spheres seem to be very simple, I think. Any further question? Yes, Andrea? That's my, my adding my own thoughts to it. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, on, the, on the structural heterogeneities where you had the white to red pictures. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I would just like to put in a word for trying to look at the probability of rearranging because if it's Arrhenius and you can pull out an energy barrier. Yeah, I, I was expecting that, that question. So, yeah, <laughs> so great. <laughs> so you've done it. Yeah, it's the last. It's one of the last slides in this thing, in case uh, in case that question came up. So we. Oh, I know you don't see anything. Um, do you see? Yes. Yeah. So the question that you had was, can I use this? Can I use the propensity measurement and and from this propensity measurement prediction, can I find an Arrhenius behavior? And I would love better data to answer the question better, to be honest with you. So we took basically the probability. So here on the left, you have, yeah, so this is kind of almost following the softness, but then from a probability perspective. And so you have four different temperatures. And so then you have the probability of uh, traveling a certain distance for these, four different tra for these four different temperatures at time 10 tau. And 10 tau is definitely longer than ballistic, but significantly shorter than something like an alpha relaxation time. And then the interesting question that you would have is if I were to then plot, for instance, one over the temperature as a function of the logarithm of the probability of rearranging here. And I didn't call it rearranging, but let's say that I will assume that everything above 0.3 is moving. What does this look like? And then we, okay, the same, the similar as what you do with softness, we group it up into six different pieces. We find, yeah, straight lines, but the, the, we don't find a single point at the moment. But on the other hand, our data is not so 
great. So I would like to go back and redo this, but then with much better data. That's on my to-do list. The reason why I think it might be good is because, you know, even if you have a not great predictor, yep. you get Arrhenius behavior, but then the range of energy barriers would be narrower. Yes. So a good way of comparing predictors is that range of energy barriers. No, I completely agree with you. Yeah. So this is, yeah, still to, be sh to still to be certain about, let's put it that way. So I have a question about the comparison with the graph neural network. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's also a question for Victor tomorrow if mm -hmm. it's there. But so you show what indeed what the graph neural network is getting. Mm -hmm. And in a certain sense, also you're also showing what it's not getting, which it looks like the nonlinear features that one could hope that graph neural network could get, they, I mean, they are not there because, I mean, at the end, uh, I mean, it's a linear, the linear regression is, is working. Yes. So uh, do you have a, an idea of, I mean, what one should do uh, to get the graph neural network to get these nonlinear features? Mm -hmm. So is it more data? Or it's something, sometimes actually it's even, I mean, a different initialization can, can, can get you a nonlinear feature that you cannot get with other initializations. So it's more a problem, it's a technical problem, or it's more we need more data to have it work. So I'm not sure that the, the I'm not sure that I would choose the word nonlinear. I know what you meant by nonlinearity. I'm not sure that I would choose the word nonlinearity used there, but I might say that the graph neural network clearly is not capturing the structure that we need in order to in order to predict the dynamics of the system better and that might be nonlinear it might be linear it's a question of what is the information though that i'm somehow missing regardless of whether i'm talking about the the linear regression where i know exactly what i've kind of dumped in and the graph neural networks where i'm doing this on an average sense i think there's a a couple of things that are complicating it so one is the fact that the graph neural network is still making a lot of averaging choices. So it does, whenever information is coming and landing back on a node, it's taking information from all of the edges and all the nodes around, but it's, but it's still only landing back on that node in a kind of functional, in, in an average functional sense. And the same goes with the, with the edges. And so mm -hmm. that, that feature, yeah, creates a pro that, that feature is creating a, a complication for the GNN. Um, I think that the other question that one can ask is, yeah, so if I'm asking, okay, do I need more data? Are there things we could use that would allow us to avoid needing more data? And so together with Klinska, we've been looking at trying to ask questions like, would an inherent state picture be a better picture to be, trading, to be training from? Because then, the therm then I don't have to train as much through, say, thermal the thermal fluctuations of the environment. Um, or can we even go better than that? And so I think that what we're seeing, at least as, as a starting point, is that the way that we describe the local environment could be better, and that it's, it's that that's really causing some of the, some of the weakness. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to get, we can get more out of, uh, out of the nonlinearity of GNNs than, say, linear regression, but we need to make sure that those things are in it somehow, or in the, in the graph neural network, and they're not necessarily there to begin with. I guess okay. that's the way Thank I you. put it. I'd love to know Victor's answer to the question too, by the way. So, <laughs> so is the spatial averaging isotropic in the end? Or in a sense. You, can you look afterwards at the spatial averaging that the graph neural network produce and check whether it's isotropic or there are some directions for it? Oh, in that, in that sense. This I don't know the answer to, Daniele, uh, immediately. We, we have always been using yeah. Like maybe there are some directions that are more relevant for, uh, for information. And yes. I was wondering whether the, there's a signature in that in the graph. Yeah, that's a. Maybe I not mean, because it gives the same thing as the, you know. The, the truth is that most graph neural networks take everything that's at, that's at the edges and the nodes and they apply like a max function, an average function, as something. So, so at the end of the day, they, they lose it. Right. They, they lose it, so maybe I think. That's one of the keys and I don't see that it can be there. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, and we can talk over coffee, but I think you lose it the same one, way you lose it. One in last question. Picture, kind of. Thank you. I was also fascinated with this comparison with linear regression and neural networks. And I wanted to ask, is there something with activation functions? Have you tried different activation, activation functions? functions for the neural, yeah, so we've played with the neural networks. We don't, we don't improve 
um, and we've played with a lot with the neural network. So in the, in particular on the last on the last sh slides I showed with the work of Rinsko, neural networks have never beat uh, linear. Well, they hit linear regression, and we can get them as good as our linear regression, but we don't get we don't get an improvement on that nonlinearity. So it seems in my mind that that's saying that that nonlinearity is not important for this prediction, at least at the moment, and, and with the information we have, or the quality of it that we have. And grab Sorry? neural networks, do they use some special activation function, or it's linear, or it's real? Or so the graph neural networks have, for every neural network, their own activation functions. And we've played, again, we've played a little bit with that, but it doesn't really matter much. Rinska can answer that question, but we've tried many different choices at the, at the nodes, at the edges, and, and yeah, it's, we get basically the same result always. Because typically when people use just real, they still stay in linear regression regime. So yeah. that's why I was curious. No, yeah. I, I, think that the, I think that the point there is that the, ac that the functions that we have capture as much of the, non of, well, it's not nonlinear, but these capture an, uh, as much of the averaging as we can do with the nonlinear functions at the moment with those input parameters, with a lot of caveats in there. So with those as the, bo as the input and with, um, yeah, that choice. Okay, so let us thank <laughs> Laura again. So we apologize for the slightly delayed start, but at least we finish uh, in time. So we will now have one and a half hour break and we will restart at uh, 2 p.m. And we will try our best to also restart mm. online. So uh, everybody who is watching online, we will be back uh, on the live streaming, uh, maybe on the other part at uh, 2 p.m. And I'm still here if there's questions, because I saw a few hands still. You're welcome. It was OK? I wasn't sure what to do, because I was looking at the talks, and I went, well, I can't go through the history of everything people are doing.